Okay, we are back to the bronze bow here, chapter 22, and I wanted to let you see the, uh, the book that I'm gonna be doing next is, um, called Buddy. Here's the, the cover. It's by M.H. Herlong. And I will read you, um, I'll read you just a tad here. One day after school starts up, everybody starts talking about a storm that's coming to New Orleans. The mayor says evacuation is mandatory, that we got to go. Daddy says we can't fit Buddy in the car. I don't want to leave Buddy, but I got to. We drive to Mississippi, and Buddy stays all alone in the upstairs bathroom. And then that hurricane comes, the one they call Katrina. Everybody says New Orleans is gone. Everybody says everything in that city is drowned. Grandpa T says, comes a time when you got to let go. But I say, this ain't that time. I got to find my buddy. So, yeah. The little boy's name is Tyrone Elijah Roberts. And everybody calls him Lil T. So, I'm probably going to be reading with kind of a southern accent. So if you guys want to to tune in and see how them Southerners talk, that's kind of the way I'm probably going to be reading, because this is written in the Southern vernacular, which means it's written according to the way people in the South talk. So that will be our next book. But we have Chapter 22, Chapter 23, and Chapter 24 of the bronze bow to complete. So, I'm headed to chapter 22. And that rhymes. Some of you have mentioned to me that you know that I'm from Tennessee or that I live in Tennessee. And you're surprised that I don't have a southern accent. Well, I actually am from the great state of Texas. And we do have a Texas accent in Texas. But um, I also lived overseas for three and a half years when I was a teenager. And I have taken multiple foreign languages. So I tend to speak as a Californian. So when you hear me talk, um, it's pretty much the way people in lovely sunny California talk. That was from Texas. Okay, here we go. Chapter 22, The Bronze Bow. Oh, I'd like to give a shout out to uh, my friend, my new friend from England, Susie Yollop. Love you, sister. It's so good to get emails from you. And those of you who want to just email me just to chit chat, you feel free, okay? It's Ms. Tudor at gmail.com. Please don't forget to like and subscribe. And here we go. Chapter 22 of the Bronze Bow. On the 15th day of Tishri, the Day of Atonement, Daniel stood in the door of his shop. Even so, even so early, the holiday spirit stirred the narrow street like a fresh breeze. No one in the village appeared to be working. Pious Jews moved with dignity toward the synagogue, looking with disdain on the frivolous folk who took the occasion for an idle holiday. Voices and laughter sounded across the housetops. Yoktan squatted on the doorstep, gnawing at the flat wheaten loaf that Daniel had brought out to him. The apprentices had the day off, he remarked, eyeing Daniel hopefully. Go ahead, then, said Daniel. There'll be little business today. When Yachtan had scampered off, he turned back to his forge. Through the morning hours, he stuck 
dourly at his work. Dour is kind of like sour. Dourly, trying to ignore the tug of restlessness in the air. Once temptation had come from the distant mountain. This time it came from the city in the plain below. At noon time, the sound of singing drifted into the shop. Daniel laid down his hammer and went into his house. Would you go with me to see Thasia? Asked Leah. Oh, let me reread that. Okay, hang on. I have an eye eyelash in my eye. Oh no, it was a piece of hair. Would you go with me to see Thasia? He asked Leah. She will be dancing with the girls in the vineyard. He spoke idly, but half seriously too, thinking that her longing to see Thasia might tempt her. Are you going? She cried. Now, then you can tell me about it. Will you go with me? He asked again. A cloud shattered her eyes. Don't tease me, Daniel. But you will go, won't you? I don't know. He answered, still trying to hide his real intentions from himself. If I have time, I have to go to the city to take a lock and key to old Omar. Not in your old work clothes, Leah protested. I've seen people going by; they're all dressed up. Wait! She ran to the chest and pulled out his clean woolen cloak, and laughed at his half-hearted grumbling as she straightened it across his shoulders. He walked along the road to the city, holding himself aloof from the holiday travelers. His unhappy, forbidding face giving no one any encouragement. In Capernaum, as he might have expected, the house of Omar was deserted, and he left his bundle inside the door. He still told himself that he did not really intend to go to the festival, but his steps turned almost against his will toward the long slope of the vineyards. It was not hard to find his way. Voices and laughter drew him on, and he had only to follow their lead. Around one of the vineyards, the young men of the town had gathered in a shifting, animated ring. He saw at once that he did not belong here. Even in his best cloak, he looked. At, he stood out plainly for just what he was—a peasant and a smith. He dared not even approach too near to these elegant youths with their gaily striped cloaks, their leather sandals, and their carefully oiled and combed forelocks and beards. They knew each other, called out greetings, jostled and jested, while he stood awkward and angry and alone. Suddenly, the merriment halted. The ring of boys tightened, drew inward. Daniel. Who stood taller than most craned his neck to see over their heads. At the other end of the vineyard, a line of girls wound slowly from the green booths, a weaving line of white-clad figures with wreaths of flowers in their hair and chains of flowers linking them to one another. The girls' voices, thin and high, and sweet, floated among the trees. Look not. Young men, upon gold or silver, nor upon beauty in these maidens, look only upon the good families from which they spring, so they may bear thee worthy sons. Still keeping well behind the row of listeners, Daniel watched the line weave nearer. Then his breath caught as he saw Thasia. He had never seen her dance, but he knew well that sure flowing grace. He had marked it on that first day on the mountain. How gently she moved! Not like some others, striving to attract all eyes, nor yet fearfully, like those who crept with downcast lashes. She simply danced, as though she loved the motion for its own sake. Her head up, her eyes shining, her lips parted in a little smile as she sang. As she came nearer, he saw that from time to time, she gazed directly at the line of men, not coyly, not boldly, but with searching. <clears throat> 
She was looking for someone, and suddenly Daniel could not bear to see her face when she found him. He was shaken with terror. In a moment she would pass by where he stood, and those seeking eyes would find him out. Standing there in his homespun garment, with his soot-grimed hands and his bare feet, would she go on, her eyes still seeking as they were now? Would, would she dare even to show that she knew him for, before these others? Or would she be ashamed? She came nearer, the line weaving and swaying. All at once Daniel turned away, pushed through the line of watchers, and plunged down the hillside. He had gone only a short way when he heard her voice. Looking back, he saw her running between the rows of vines, the white veil floating behind her. She came to a stop a little distance from him, out of breath, with color flaming in her cheeks. "'Why did you leave?' she cried. "'You know why,' he answered. "'I was a fool to come. "'I invited you. "'You did me no kindness.' He saw the quick hurt that leaped like the mark of a blow into her face. I know you meant to be kind, he stammered. I I'm glad I saw you dance. Now I can tell Leah. Is that the only reason you came? To tell Leah? He stared at her miserably. You should go back to your friends, he said. You belong with them. Thasia moved forward slowly until she stood quite close to him. Do you think I am just a pretty child? Do you still think I am just a pretty child, Daniel? He flushed wretchedly. So she had remembered. As he stared at her, the lips that spoke the words trembled, and the dark eyes had, brightened, had a bright sheen of tears. No, he blurted, the truth wrenched out of him in a headlong need to make amends. I did not mean it even then, that day, when I woke in the passage. It was a woman's face I saw, the one face I will always remember as long as I live. Thasia did not speak. She stood, straight and proud, with her face lifted to his, and did not try to hide from him what his words had done. The deep, shining happiness was like a lighted lamp, glowing brighter, till it threatened to blind him. Don't, Thasia, he choked. I never meant you to know. Why not? Because it's no use. I ask only one thing of life. I have no right to the things other people have. Is this thing worth so much? Are you sure, Daniel? I have taken an oath. He watched the light waver and die down. I took the vow, too, she said. We vowed to live and die for God's victory. There is more than one way of fighting. Joel sees that now. I only know one way to fight, he said. I don't have words like Joel's. I have only my two hands. Her voice broke. Will there never be an end to it? The hate and the killing? Thasia, he burst out. Don't torment me. I have to see it through alone. There's no room for anyone else. She did not speak again. She stood still, taking this truth as she had taken the other, with her head lifted, not trying to hide the hurt any more that she had hidden the happiness. No, not trying to hide the hurt any more than she had hidden the happiness, wrapped in a sort of pride that made the ordinary pride of women seem silly. Let me go now, Thasia. She nodded. God go with you, she said, whatever you do. He looked back once and saw her still standing on the slope looking after him. He walked the miles back to the village as he had come, aloof from the others, protected behind his dark scowl. 
He was weary and sore in spirit, and he did not want to talk about the festival. But the moment he saw Leia, he knew he could not escape. She waited like a good child, her hands folded in her lap, her blue eyes eager. What was it like? Did Glacia look pretty? What did she wear? Some sort of white thing, Daniel answered indifferently. Then, looking at his sister, he felt through his own hurt, a fresh pain at the thought of her waiting here in this dingy room, while the other girls danced in the sunlight. The least he could do was tell her. They had flowers in their hair, he began with an effort. Then, on an impulse, he stepped outside the door and pulled up a handful of cockle blossoms that had sprung up by the house, looped them into a garland, and set them on the golden hair. Like this, he said. Enchanted, Leia put up her hands to touch the flowers. Then they formed a long line and danced. This way? Leia began to sway from side to side, lifting her feet, her arms raised over her head. Astonished, he watched her. How could she know what it meant to dance? Those untaught motions had an instinctive rhythm. Surprised out of his own gloom, he actually smiled at her. You should have danced with them, Leia. You're as pretty as any of them. She stopped dancing and stood in front of him, her blue eyes grave. Am I pretty, Daniel? That he, of all people, should have been asked such a question twice in one day. The memory of Thasia's glowing beauty made him answer his sister very gently. Indeed you are, Leia. Truly, Daniel, as pretty as those girls you saw today? much prettier than most of them. He had meant to please her, but he was surprised that his answer should seem so important to her. Thasia said so, too, she said seriously, thinking this over as though it were something she had never before considered. Do you think perhaps someone else might think so? Not just you and Thasia? Joel said so, too. With a little smile, she dismissed Joel. He is kind, like Thasia, isn't he? He said, she said her thoughts elsewhere. Then she made one of her surprising turns to the practical. Your supper is ready, she said. I have a surprise for you. The mat was already laid out for him, and he saw that he would have to eat, what, however little he wanted to. With the garland still in her hair, Leia unwrapped the bread and set out the bowl of boiled carrots and onions. Even as in his own preoccupation, he noticed the trembling eagerness with which she watched him eat, like a child brimming with a secret that can scarcely be contained. When the vegetables were finished, she went behind the curtain in the corner. She brought out a woven basket of fruit. He saw at once that it was very fine fruit, sleek scarlet pomegranates, plump, juicy figs, yum, the sort of fruit that no Galilean ever kept for his own table, and only once a year dared to reserve for the sacrifice of first fruits at the temple in Jerusalem. What neighbor could have brought such a gift? <clears throat> Is this payment for your weaving? he asked her. No, she said, breathless with pleasure. It was a present for me. He waited, puzzled. Marcus brought it today. His teeth, already sunk into the first luscious bite, stopped as though he had struck a rottenness. Who is Marcus? You know, the soldier who comes on the horse. He sent the pomegranate spinning across the room. He heard the sickish, sickish splash as it flattened against the wall and saw the basket rolling from his vicious kick. He was on his feet, half blind and shaking. With a wail, Leia went down on her knees, scrabbling on the floor for an orange, sobbing, trying to wipe it against her dress. He snatched it from her hand. How do you know his name? he shouted. How dare a Roman dog bring you anything? 
Leia cowered against the wall. Answer me! How do you know him? He reached out, gripped her shoulders, and held her up. Without a sound, Leia drooped. He heard his own voice shouting words he had never used before, words he had heard in the cave. Then slowly the whirling blackness slowed down and his sight began to clear. In the center of the blackness he saw his sister, shrinking under his hands. The garland of flowers slipped sideways on the streaming golden hair, her white face averted, waiting for his blow. His hands unclenched and let her fall. Shamed, he stood back. I'm not going to hurt you, he said more quietly. Answer me. What has this man done? Faintly, her voice came from under the screen of hair. He's been my friend. How long? Since last summer. He's come to see me when you were gone away. He held himself rigid. You've let a Roman come into my house? No, no, he has never come into the house. What then? Tell me. He, he sits on his horse outside the garden wall and talks to me. Only that. You give me your word? She raised her head and looked at him with such a strange dignity that he packed, backed away. What does he talk about? He doesn't know many words. He tells me about his family. They live far away in a place God, called Galia. He lives in a little village with a forest all around it. His village, village was conquered by the Romans. He has a brother and two little sisters, and they all have yellow hair like mine. I wanted to tell you, Daniel, so many times I wanted to. But whenever he came to the shop, when you even thought about him, your face was so black. I was afraid. You should have been afraid. I would have torn his tongue out. I will yet when I find him. Her face went gray. No, oh no! Suddenly she flung herself at her feet. Don't harm him. Tell me you won't harm him. Oh, if you hurt him, I will die. He looked down at her, loathing her. But he knew that she had told him the truth. The Roman had not come into his house. Stop groveling and listen to me, he said cruelly. If I do not kill him, you must never speak to him again. No, never. You must give me your solemn word. I do. I promise you anything. I promise anything you say. You will not show yourself when he, where he can see you. No, I will never go out into the garden again. You have brought shame on my house, and on Simon's house, and on your father's name, on the name of Israel, even. She began to walk, sob again. Weep, he railed at her. Weep your silly tears. See if you can cry your shame away. He turned blindly toward the door, wanting only to be out of sight of her. She lay with her head against the earth floor, her face hidden. For an instant he wavered. Then he remembered something. When was it? On a summer day she had said, He is homesick. Even then, all this time she had deceived him. He plunged through the door and out into the street. For hours he walked, rushing through the village streets, trampling the pastures on the slope, striding along the road, drenched by intermittent rain. At first he had some wild thought of finding the Roman. For most of the night he did not really know where he went. As the first pink streaks of light streamed up in the sky, he turned back toward the village. He was exhausted and empty, and his shoulder throbbed with pain. He had walked out the fierce anger that had driven him. Now in its place, shame flowed in. It was a good thing he had not met a legionary in the night. He might have brought down a reprisal on the whole village. Now that his head was clearer, he saw that in spite of his bitter loathing, no one else would recognize his claim to vengeance. The Roman legion had its own laws, strict as those of the Jews. But it was unlikely there was any law, either Roman or Jewish, that said a Roman legionary could not speak to a Jewish woman over a garden wall. What did Rome mean to Leia? She had seen a boy scarcely older than herself, with yellow hair like her own. But why hadn't she been afraid? 
I shouldn't have shouted at her, he thought with shame. I will try to make it up to her. I will show her that she does not need to be afraid of me. But let that Roman never set foot in his shop again. The house was very quiet. On the floor of the room the spilled fruit lay in the dust. Leia sat in a corner, a wilted blossom still clinging to her hair. When Daniel came in, she did not raise her head. And that is the end of chapter 22. May the Lord bless and keep you. May He make His face shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift His countenance upon you and give you peace and give you shalom. Until next time.